supprimée par Frank B. Edwards. L'ordre supprimé aptitude à la lecture a été donné à 16h37, environ une heure après que Jérémy Lozon eut dit pour la centième fois à son enseignant qu'il aurait préféré ne jamais avoir appris à lire. Comme d'habitude, il se plaignait de devoir étudier trois chapitres d'un roman en vue d'en faire la critique. Il disait détester la lecture. Au poste de contrôle central du ministère des Écoles, il était hors de question pour Mme Duracuir de tolérer de telles sottises. Humorless and dry as a chalkbrush, she was a stickler for rules and was not about to dole out any second, third, or hundred chances to the likes of Jeremy, who she considered an ungrateful waster. The regulation stated quite clearly that students fully reading enabled who continuously refused to apply the skills taught them by the ministry could have said skills revoked until such time as. There was really no need to read the fine print. The deed was done the minute she punched in Jeremy's personal identification number hit the delete button and confirmed her authority to do so with a sharp swipe of her ministry validation card. You wouldn't have known what hit him, she mused, as the computer beeped twice to confirm that the task was complete. If Miss Dreadnought was expecting some dramatic moment of regret on Jeremy's part, she was due for disappointment, as he was much too busy teasing a tall, rather angular girl named Prism to notice the brief wave of energy that spiraled through his brain's angular gyrus region instantly disrupting his ability to read. Not until the pair stood at the counter of a recently opened burger outlet 15 minutes later did it occur to him that anything was altered. The pictures of the various takeout meals looked no different than last week, but the words around them were meaningless. Quand il fait avec les affiches de manger la prisonne? Bien, que veux-tu dire? Mal à l'aise et ignorant la question. Laisse tomber. Que prends-tu? Unable to decipher the words beneath the pictures, he simply parroted Prism's burger and fries for order. The energy pulse had nothing to affect his common sense. His counting skills were another matter, though. He fumbled badly as he tried to make sense of the handful of coins he pulled from his pocket and ended up simply handing the clerk a $5 bill, which turned out not to be enough. Gracefully, Prism saved him, scooping a collection of dimes and quarters from his palm. Pay attention, Jira, she said, then giggled her way down to the end of the counter to pick up her order. The rest of the afternoon passed in confusion. Not because Jeremy had trouble finding his way, for he knew the route well after seven years of walking, of walking home from school, but rather because the familiar world around him had shifted mysteriously. The houses and the streets were the same and as they had been the previous day. But this afternoon, the billboards, street signs, everything involving letters and numbers had taken on a foreign air. Words no longer made sense although no one else seemed to have noticed the change. Waiting at Prism's bus stop, he was constantly distracted from their conversation by the confusing destination signs on each bus that approached them. Ay ngay, uvanito nga ilin no kakto nga jer had o kakto agasang kalwato na. So kalwa ka vi? Jer may o kakumayo kalwa taas mo nga kisa na o kangi nakto na isumalo ni tema o kakalwa ka kapya salong na kakto gilo niyo when she finally stepped aboard her bus with a wave and a smile, he breathed a sigh of relief and headed the few blocks home. Stepping through the front door, he was happy to discover that his parents had gone out for the evening. There was a short note for him on the fridge door that he studied brief, briefly without comprehension. It was probably about dinner, but he had snacked with Prism already so ignored it. Instead, he slumped down at the computer, figuring he would message Sean to see if he had any idea of what was going on. 
The keyboard confused him, so he closed his eyes, moving his fingers instinctively to log on. In December, his house came to a conference at giving him all pop. Ce mur a crioté dans le bord de l'écran. Il abandonna. Il aurait pu se servir du téléphone, mais il refusa à tenter de dépêcher la liste des numéros que ça Instead, he idly picked up his homework novel, flipped through it, but quickly tossed it aside. Useless. He flopped down in front of the television and started the slow process of clicking through all 400 channels to find something worth watching. He had no idea what time it was. Anxious to avoid encountering his parents, he headed to his room before they returned. Laying on his bed, trying to make sense of his surroundings, he took comfort in the basketball players who graced his posters, for he still knew their names, their numbers, their teams, even their statistics, by heart. As long as he didn't have to write any of it down, things still made sense, he convinced himself before he fell asleep, but not as much sense as they had before. He slept fitfully, wrestling with dreams of a wordless world. That night, Jim Deerwell was working at the late shift at the ministry's control desk and spent the first hour, as he always did, perusing Miss Dreadnought's daily delete report. Amused by her fervid illiteracy campaign, he methodically worked through the list, restoring the jolted minds of the dozen wasters the wrath had visited that afternoon. Cantankerous old gal really should retire, he chuckled as he sent a gentle shock through Jer Jeremy's brain. Her, but her tiny cold heart is in the right place, I suppose. At least we're unlikely to have any more trouble with young Jeremy.